South Park is a very special show. I mean, not just any series can survive and still remain relevant 26 seasons in. Today, we'll be covering the video games of South Park, including Snow Day, which just recently dropped. I do not plan on covering the Game Boy game since it never formally released to the public. Same goes for the unreleased Simpsons Hit and Run clone, but that probably would have been S tier if it ended up dropping. Spoilers, I guess, but most of these games are years old at this point, and I'll be vague discussing any story content. With all that being said, let's get started with the only D-tier entry, a strange and questionable title that doesn't use the IP to the fullest. Chef's Love Shack is stupid. This is the second South Park game to ever exist, and this is interesting at best. I mean, it released in an era where anyone and everyone made a video game just to make a quick buck. The only good thing I would say about this is that the minigames are fun. It's like a Mario Party game, so after every round you play one, and these are alright, but the base game is trivia. And a lot isn't even related to the series. It'll literally just be generic game show questions. Sometimes they're completely normal, sometimes it'll be normal but worded in a way that references the show and the characters. I don't know, this whole thing is weird. A strange game. The worst part about it is that if you're playing alone, you don't compete against anyone. No computers. It'll just be you by yourself playing trivia and going through mini games. It's pointless. Next, we have the C tier entries, the content that has a mix of quirkiness and good ideas. We're tackling the very first South Park game ever. The first person shooter that was on the N64 among other consoles. I'm unsure why they believed this would best be translated into a first person shooter instead of any other genre, but eh, why not? The game grants us the first 3D modeled version of this world and its characters, and a different version of the series intro. All four of the main kids are available to play as, and it's a lot of turkeys, snowballs, dodgeballs, toy guns, and UFOs in the sky. There's aliens and fill-ups to throw, there's robots, cutscenes with voice acting, bigger robots. Throughout it all, there's a narrative that obviously relies on old South Park material, with classic characters like Chef in the story. It wasn't revolutionary or groundbreaking. Some of the other games available during this era were certainly more intriguing, but this was a piece of memorable content that encompasses everything about the early days of the show. I wanna go and drive a Hummer, that's what I wanna do. I wanna drive a car that goes, that goes rum, 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 rum. A few months after the release of Chef's Love Shack came South Park Rally, a kart racer. To me, this has got some issues as well. The biggest thing being that there are a lot of different objectives in this game, and at least in the championship mode, it typically involves more than just mindlessly racing for first place. Some involve collecting a trophy and racing with that, there's another one where everyone has mad cow disease and whoever holds onto the antidote and cures themselves first wins. Kind of like the Shine Thief mode from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Even in stages where the objective is to simply race, you'll be required to touch checkpoints on tracks that are non-linear. So comparing it to Mario Kart again, it's like trying to race on a battle course stage. It's awkward, unsatisfying, and doesn't really work. It has a great amount of content though for a game that released in 2000. Across the different platforms, there are 9 different tracks, 22 different items to use, and 35 characters to choose from. Not bad at all. And an arcade mode and multiplayer also exists, which certainly increases the game's replayability. The game includes a special version of the show's intro as well, but the PlayStation and N64 versions actually have the same intro with alternate scenes. It's a flawed game, but it isn't unredeemable. Next up, we're tackling the B-tier games, the stuff that's pretty dang good. Oh my god! Oh my god! 
<laughs> I made you eat your parents. South Park Tenorman's Revenge is the only multiplayer platformer for the series that came to fruition. This Xbox 360 game involves playing as the four main kids on their quest to get Cartman's Xbox hard drive back, which was stolen by Scott Tenorman, who by the way is genuinely one of the wildest South Park characters. He is a villain that was relevant during the earlier seasons of the show and is Cartman's half-brother, which most importantly means that Cartman is half-ginger. Anyways, it makes a lot more sense to me that they finally used the show for a story-driven platforming game like this compared to the first-person shooter, the kart racer, and the trivia game that included a lot of irrelevant questions having nothing to do with the series. So at least after all that randomness, we got something more fitting. The game has a few interesting boss fights, for sure. One involves Tenorman and a big robot with extendable arms. Another involves a fight with Man Bear Pig. Uh, Satan gets involved too at one point. And there's a mechanic involving the superhero alter egos as well that's tied in pretty nicely. It's most fun when playing with three other friends, but solo it's also possible to switch between the characters at ease. Overall, there's clearly a lot of South Park goodness here for any to enjoy, and I personally want to see more South Park platformers like this in the future. Yes! Yes! There's no ski! It's a snow day! South Park Snow Day just released a few days ago at the time of this recording, and it has brought us back into a 3D experience, which hasn't been around since 2000's South Park Rally. With this releasing after Stick of Truth and Fractured Butthole, I, like many others, immediately assumed this would not be as good as those games, with this being in the 3D format and the focus on co-op. It's pretty good anyways. The creators of the show were very involved in the making of the game, so a lot of the writing is on par with the show. Near the beginning, Randy Marsh will be found frozen in an ice wall due to him going outside and getting toilet paper to prepare for the big snow day. Hurry, my balls are freezing! And as the title mentions, the snow day concept is obviously a major deal here. All the children of South Park are off of school, and with the news reporting just how bad the weather is, there is chaos about and some characters that need help. Like how at one point Ned and Jimbo will want a barrel of NFTs. You know what desperate stupid people want? NFTs. Now go find me some. There's a lot of combat and fighting children, so a ton of whining kids will be heard throughout the playthrough. There's blood everywhere! And I won't spoil anything here, but there are certainly some captivating boss fights present in the game. It seems like creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker have picked up on implementing the show format into the games for a good experience. So some cutscenes are present like at the beginning, that visually looks exactly like something out of the show. And with this being a modern South Park game, the playable character is the customizable silent protagonist known as the new kid. Is this the best South Park game ever? No, I don't think so. I would say one convenience of modern gaming in particular that is lacking here is crossplay. It does not exist here and it has not been announced that it is coming. But there is a season pass with DLC for those interested in it. That being said, there is absolutely a lot to enjoy here as a fan of the show and a boatload of toilet humor. Now at the halfway point, we're going to check out the South Park pinball tables and pinball FX. The main machine, known as South Park Super Sweet Pinball, crams as many characters and references as possible into one experience, and it's really well done. There's many standing around in the machine, such as Mr. Garrison in the corner, and Chef on the left side. There's Kenny, who stands around and, tied to a mechanic, will occasionally die. And there's a Stan and Kyle, with Kyle connected to a Mr. Hanky multiball. Achieving that grants three balls of poo to play with. And there's Randy, who's up in the corner on the Sarcastiball field, which in itself acts like its own miniature pinball game. If it wasn't clear already, this is South Park through and through. While playing, character voice lines will be heard throughout the entire experience, and familiar musical jingles will play indicating different things. 
and it is all complemented by the iconic South Park sign outside of the machine. There are so many references both visually and audibly for fans to appreciate here, and it effortlessly blends together. The other pinball machine, Butter's very own pinball game, is of the same quality and obviously represents the character well, with a ton of his voice lines playing throughout and everything present on the board. There are still characters standing around with a stage for Butters himself where he will come on and off wearing different costumes. And the whole experience takes place in Butters' bedroom with his Professor Chaos helmet sitting on the left. Speaking of Professor Chaos, there's a mini pinball section of the machine that's all about the villainous alter ego and it's done yeah. well here. If I had to choose between the two, I would pick the super sweet pinball machine, although I do like the Butters one a lot, and both experiences are of the same quality, I just prefer the general show theming compared to Butters specifically. And with that, it's time to go back to the ranking. Yeah, no dude, I'm telling you, it was the worst pain of my entire life. How many hours were you guys playing? Like six hours, dude. And my friends were all like, dude, Carmen, we need you to keep playing defense. Ah! South Park Phone Destroyer is the only mobile game the series has ever gotten, and it's pretty cool. You get well immersed into the world with a beginning cutscene that looks like something right out of the show. There's a legend of a new sharpshooter, a kid who is a master of his phone. This kid is apparently on the phone all the time. And the whole game is good like that, with the art style remaining in the traditional format throughout. And to me, that is the best way to do South Park games. Using the video game medium to add onto the show's vibe, compared to just using the IP and turning it into something random for the hell of it. It's a card-based strategy game where energy needs to be spent to spawn in troops. Similar to Supercell's Clash Royale. And this is also from Ubisoft, so just like their other entries that define this modern era of South Park video game representation, the story involves the characters playing pretend, role-playing in costumes with the new kid. In this game in particular, they begin by playing cowboys and Indians, but other themes are present in the experience as well, such as superheroes, sci-fi, and mythology. There's mainly a story mode to play through, but player versus player and events are also available modes to work on. And there's a lot of dialogue from the real voice actors, not just ripped from the show, but for this game specifically, and it further adds to the immersion. This goes for the background music present as well, being reminiscent to traditional South Park music. The phone concept is emphasized heavily, with text notifications appearing at the top of the screen from different characters, the character you make, New Kid, being on their phone throughout the whole thing, winning a game will show a phone with a big green thumbs up on its screen, and you'll even receive the occasional FaceTime call from Cartman. Hello, New Kid. It's me, the Coon! Lockers will be opened up at the end of levels similar to how chests or loot boxes behave in other mobile games. And surprise, surprise, a store exists where card packs can be obtained. Because microtransactions. But taking everything here into consideration, it seems like actual effort was put into this game. Loading screens will showcase really detailed art of the characters, same goes for the cards, and it originally released back in 2017 and for years was getting supported with content updates until it was announced that in mid-2022 there will be an end to that. So it doesn't get updated anymore, and it's a mobile game, which comes with the expected annoyances. If you want to get even better, please head on over to our store. But with all that being said, it is also an enjoyable game that screams South Park with the art style we know and love, and the legendary voices of its beloved characters. Greetings, honorable warrior! I am the fight promoter, Don King Butters! This mobile game, of all things, actually holds up well. Next up is the only A-tier entry, a genuinely fun game that I would love to see get a sequel one day. Dude, Stan, get out here! What's going on, Cartman? Horrible beings are trying to get to the town! We have to hold them off here! Uh, what? We've made it to South Park, let's go tower defense play, baby. This was an interesting little game, available through the Xbox Live Arcade, 
And it wasn't pushing any boundaries or anything back when this was released in 2009. Just like how some of the other games on this list are of random genres, I don't really understand how people watched the show and thought, oh, this would make for a perfect tower defense game. But here we are nonetheless, and I'm all for it. Back in my day on my iPod, I would be living my best life playing The Creeps, which for those who haven't heard of it, is a really solid tower defense game where you fight off ghosts and monsters. And relatively similar to it, I was playing the classic Plants vs. Zombies as well. So with this game's gameplay, I'm picking up on those same great vibes. Throughout the whole thing, there are cutscenes that have a comic book-like aesthetic to them and dedicated voice acting, so the passion and care is certainly present here. Oh, you guys! I think I shadowed a testicle! There's multiplayer local and online, which is assisted by there being 14 playable characters, although I'm unsure whether the online component works well, if at all, with the game being over a decade old at this point. Throughout the game's journey, many enemy types such as hippies and aliens will be present throughout, and it all effectively differentiates this from being not just any game, but a South Park game. There are many familiar faces from the show, and with this in particular, there is also an overall Chinese-Japanese theme, with some of the background music present and the font of the title, there being a Japanese announcer, who's really just Trey Parker doing an accent. I'm so sorry, Kaido, but I am starving. Which would you rather I eat? Should I eat a cuttlefish and asparagus or the vanilla pesto? <laughs> There's a Great Wall of China surrounding South Park that's a part of the story. Mongolian enemies to defeat. Overall, it was another weird idea for a game, but it worked, and if this was to get remastered or receive a sequel, I would be into it. Good gameplay, great variety of enemy types, and an effective use of the IP. So you are the hand releasing all those hippies and ginger kids. We won't let you get away with it, buddy. Hippies and ginger kids? You know, my evil plan was to replace all the vitamin water at the grocery stores with plain old boring water. With all that being said, it's now time for the S-tiers the greatest of all South Park games. <laughs> to many, The Stick of Truth was the first true South Park game. How glorious it was to walk around freely and explore South Park, Colorado. You could check out Eric Cartman's house. You could rummage through Eric Cartman's closet. You could take a sh at Eric Cartman's house. Even creators Matt and Trey said they weren't in love with the South Park games previous to this era. Before, the games were more out there and random, but this was the first to fully use the format to their advantage to tell a unique story. Stick of Truth is South Park. Thanks to Matt and Trey's heavy involvement, the jokes, characters, and art style are essentially identical to the show. So it's really like one long episode. And with the franchise consistently making fun of everyone and everything, they unsurprisingly incorporate humor into some of the video game tropes. With this being an RPG, there are mystical character classes to choose from, and they decided to implement Jew as one of the classes. And choosing this grants the player special attire. Do you have so I guess we'll never really be friends. There's some Pokemon collectibles to hunt down in the game's world. And yeah, some of the overall content present in the game is really intriguing. Obviously South Park is controversial, but the game had seven scenes that were banned in both Australia and Europe that were replaced by still images and descriptions since they either involved anuses or abortions. Here's an example of an Australia censorship screen. Sorry, Australia, you're not able to play this section of the game. In this part, Mr. Mackie, Craig, Mr. Slave, and you have been abducted. They are bound to high tables, still appear to be asleep, and are being thoroughly probed through their anuses. Well, that sucks. And up on screen is Europe's version. Outside of all that controversial stuff, Chef appears as a zombie, and Canada is explored. Farts can be used as a weapon, 
And they go all out with toilet humor. Farting on an opponent at precisely the right time is key to battle. I mean, every toilet found can be pooed in by mashing the button, and you can grab your poo from out of the toilet and keep it. Revolutionary stuff here. It looks like the show, it's written by the showrunners, <laughs> it involves everyone from the show, it is obviously everything you would want from a South Park game, and thankfully, they made more. Mom! The new kid is trying to play with the cube of ultimate destruction! You be nice to all your friends, Eric. Be a good sharer. Good sharer? It'll blow up the galaxy! Stupid bitch! We've made it to the fractured butthole, and I crown this and the Stick of Truth as the winners of this ranking. With the fractured butthole being a direct sequel, and these being the only entries that feel like South Park at its best in the immersive format of video games. But let's analyze the fractured butthole specifically. I mean, with the name they managed to slide in butthole. That's genius. Personally, I am more of a fan of the superhero theme compared to Stick of Truth's fantasy theme, and I'm into the grid system combat that allows for more variety compared to the simple Stick of Truth combat. And, just like its predecessor, a lot of wild moments stand out in the game. Towelie is introduced and a battle with him begins at one point. There is the lovely, spontaneous Bootay, who comes in as a boss at the strip club. I'm gonna break every bone in your body with my booty, baby. Jared Fogle from Subway is a boss that the kids fight. Hey kids, you want some candy? Oh. It's Jared. And finally, a favorite detail of mine is what happens when you put in the correct Mom. pin of certain keypads without finding the code yeah. in the game Mom. first. Hey, Tom Brady, you want to play the game or do you just want to be known as a smug cheating bitch the rest of your life? Such an unnecessary but awesome detail. And if you continue trying to do this, he will pop up more. You broke the rules, rules, rules. But anyways, that's all for this video. I'll see you next time. Mr. Yamashiro is actually a very good driver. Microaggression. Hit him.